Well, thank you, Andrew. Good morning. As Andrew mentioned, my name is DJ Betancourt. I have the pleasure of serving as the Deputy Commissioner of the New Hampshire Insurance Department. And I want to thank you for joining us for our monthly webinar. Uh, this month's webinar obviously focuses in on the legislative session. And in terms of the department's legislative initiatives, it was yet another incredibly successful year for us. Uh, to a large degree, and I, I can't stress this enough, uh, the success that we have enjoyed here at this department with the legislature is a credit to the team here at the department who, over the course of many years, has worked hard to establish trust and credibility with the legislature. When our subject matter experts appear before the legislature to advocate for a department initiative or to provide information on legislation, legislators know that they are hearing from honest brokers who are providing factual arguments on behalf of New Hampshire consumers. And I'm very pleased to be joined by two of those subject matter experts here this morning to review some of the key initiatives from the past session. And so I'll turn things over now to Jason and James. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jason Dexter. I'm the Director of Life and Health at the department. Uh, DJ, thank you for the introduction. Uh, there's a just three bills that from the prior session that we wanted to touch on uh, from a life and health perspective today. The first bill is um, House Bill 613, which is a bill that the department uh, requested based on uh, a, a statute RSA 404 of G, which was outdated, and we need to do a couple of things in the bill, ultimately repeal some legacy programs, and then amend the language to align with the current programs um, that are administered by the New Hampshire Health Plan, and then to make some clarifications to uh, accessible entities. So that bill went through um, really without much issue, and we were happy to have it uh, done so we have our statute uh, more accurate. Secondly, uh, there was a bill that did some small minor amendments to the uh, credentialing procedures. The, the law already requires um, providers to provide notice if there's a change in their credentialing statute requirements. Uh, what they what this particular bill did was uh, set a time frame for uh, carriers to respond to those changes and then directed the insurance department to collect complaints. Um, and then respond to them um, as necessary. That's something that the department already did, so that's a, that's an easy one for us. It simply codifies an action that we were previously doing. Um, the final bill we wanted to mention is a super important one, Senate Bill 85, which is um, a larger bill that implements a number of strategies to address the system of delivering emergency behavioral health services. Um, and establishes what's what's called the behavioral health crisis program. The the big uh, so there's several programs in there. The big change for the insurance laws was to expand the definition uh, of insurance laws in 417 F related to coverage for emergency services to clarify that um, emergency health service, mental health services applied to mobile crisis response and stabilization service programs um, are covered. Um, and ultimately, initial care without prior authorization is what happens with that change. Uh, so very important bill. I'm also happy to see that one go through. And those are the three updates we had for life and health. Hi, this is uh, this is James Fox and uh, I'm the PNC director and we have uh, three updates. Uh, the first update is to the fire statute. Um, as, as its name suggests, it is it is the fire statute and uh, it's the uh, only statute which actually has the the base insurance policy uh, in it. So the, the fire property insurance fire uh, policy is in the statute uh, and uh, what also the statute addresses those combination coverages. So if you go beyond fire and we had uh, two sections originally in there, one I believe for the 1960s and one from the 1980s, um, they addressed the same issue of the combination coverages. So basically if you go beyond fire um, and the 1961 had some antiquated language and I personally don't like to have uh, two different sections addressing the same issue and, and with different language. So all we did is we deleted the 1960 version and took a little bit of other antiquated language out of the 81 version. 
so now we just have one um, version of how you handle um, adding coverages beyond fire. Um, so it was, a, it was almost a bit of a housekeeping thing that I've been wanting to get to uh, for several years now. Uh, the second um, bill is HB 249. That's on pet insurance. Um, it also addressed uh, restaurant owners. But that was not our piece. Uh, that is not a housekeeping one. That was to um, introduce uh, really what's a fairly, I would say, exploding line of uh, of pet insurance and how to regulate it. Um, the reason we thought maybe it would be appropriate to have uh, its own uh, statute is that it's really partakes of uh, both property insurance. Um, pets have always historically uh, in tort law been viewed as a property insurance, uh, but in terms of the health of the pet is also more of, of like a health product. Um, as uh, as uh, John Hunt said uh, during the hearing, uh, the, our, our, our pet insurance statute is um, very similar to what the old uh, health insurance statute in New Hampshire used to look like. Uh, and so we uh, basically had taken um, some issues that we had seen. We've taken a model to start with, but then we've seen uh, issues that we have seen in terms of pre-existing injuries, waiting periods uh, to basically give everyone a level playing field. And like these are the minimum standards that are required. Here's how we're going to regulate it to start. And then the goal is to see how it operates uh, over a few years. And then if we need to make any tweaks to it, uh, we will. Uh, we think that's a, a, a big advancement, uh, both uh, as as regulators and for uh, for the pets in New Hampshire uh, and the pet owners. And the last one we had, uh, which is SB uh, 142, uh, that uh, was pretty much uh, housekeeping. Uh, we used to have some language that called rating organizations. Um, that's the only place it appears in the statute. Usually they're called advisor organizations. So we just removed uh, rating organization uh, from um, the, the, the from the statute on rates. And the other thing we did in that is we just clarified um, what would be uh, public and what would be uh, private in terms of proprietary information that insurance companies use to develop their rates. Um, and so that that's it for for last year's legislation for property casualty that we would make note of. Great, and I will cover the retained items. So I see a lot of people on the call today who. Uh, follow the legislature quite a bit. Uh, and as they probably are well aware, the legislature did give us quite a bit of homework to do over the summer and into this fall. Uh, by way of background, for those of you who are not as well versed in the legislative process, in the first year of the legislative session, the legislature has the ability to hold on to legislation for the remainder of, of that year. If the bill is particularly complicated, controversial, or perhaps they just need some more time to find uh, information and collect data. And so a couple of the notable bills that we're working on are uh, the department's initiative to accept the opportunity that the federal that the federal government has made available to states uh, to enforce the federal provisions of the No Surprises Act. And so we're working through some issues to do that. We're figuring out how best to uh, perhaps make uh, New Hampshire's balanced billing laws uniform uh, with the federal process and be able to move forward with the department being in the driver's seat to um, enforce uh, the consumer protections within the No Surprises Act. The second thing the legislature has asked us to look into is the uh, issue of prompt, prompt payments uh, in the, in the um, managed care system. So for all of the carriers taking a look at how well they process claims how quickly they get uh, the uh, owed amounts to the providers. Is that process timely? Are there bugs and issues that have to be worked out in that system? Our team right now is busy looking into that. We will have a presentation on what we have found uh, later this fall. And the last thing we've been asked to do are two mandate reviews. One mandate review pertains to a pediatric um, prosthetics uh, in uh, the athletic realm and so we're looking into that and then the second involves infertility treatments uh, we have contracted with a third-party consultant to help us work through that and we will have our findings for the legislature uh, come this fall uh, and we'll see what that where that brings us so as we look to 2024 
you will note that we are carrying a lighter load in terms of department initiatives. In the first instance, because we don't believe in filing legislation simply for the sake of filing legislation. And also because we've accomplished a lot of important reforms over the past couple of years. Uh, that being said, there are a couple of important uh, initiatives that we will bring forward that we believe are core to our consumer protection mission here at the department. One involves trying to bring some further clarity and accountability and protections uh, to consumers who are accessing their care through a health share organization. Uh, we have had some real problems in New Hampshire. We have seen some real problems nationally uh, with some of these organizations, particularly around their customer service, particularly around their financial solvency. And so we're going to try to find a pathway forward so that those organizations who want to sell to New Hampshire consumers understand what the regulatory expectations of them are here in New Hampshire. Uh, and we look forward to working on them as we move forward, uh, working with them, excuse me, as we move forward with this initiative. The second big area regards consumer guarantee contracts. Uh, those contracts and how we deal with them here at the department are found in RSA 415C. And again, we are seeing some really troubling trends as it pertains to consumer protections, how these products are marketed, how the claims are processed, things of that nature. Uh, and we feel as though that given what we're seeing, um, the trends that we are seeing as they come through our consumer division, uh, warrant the department to take a look at how we are regulating these products and how we can do it better for the benefit of the New Hampshire consumer. And then the second, uh, the, excuse me, the third item, uh, which is part of our overall commitment to trying to make our process here more efficient, more streamlined, is to look at how we can allow carriers to conduct audit inspections for workers' compensation uh, through a virtual platform. Uh, so we're looking forward to that discussion as well. We think that that will be a benefit to, to the industry and ultimately to the consumer. So again, those are the big three. As I've mentioned, we're carrying a little bit of a lighter load, but those are some, those are some important ones, we believe. And then obviously, we will be available as a resource to the legislature in any uh, legislation that particular state representatives or state senators might bring forward. So while our particular list seems a little light, uh, we anticipate that we will be pretty much just as busy as we always are uh, being of service to the legislature. So you'll note there the legislative filing periods. Um, they are pretty consistent in terms of what the House has usually done, which is that September time frame, pretty short window. Um, I found it to be a little bit of a departure for the Senate. They traditionally had a longer uh, filing period a little bit later in the fall. Uh, but they're going to go with that late September to uh, early October time uh, uh, period. Uh, so that's that's what we're looking at in terms of when legislation can be filed. Any questions? Uh, yeah, before we uh, get to Timothy's question, I just want to invite everyone to uh, type their question into the chat box. We'll take some time now to address those for you. Timothy asks, please provide more detail about the issues you are seeing around consumer guarantee contracts. Sure, Memphis, well, I'll provide, I'll provide <laughs> one example and, and perhaps James can fill another. We are aware of a consumer in New Hampshire, a senior citizen consumer in New Hampshire, who was sold five burial policies by the same company. That is just wrong. That type of marketing technique, of that treatment of the consumer is just wrong. And it is one of a number of different things that we are seeing that are very, very concerning to us. Uh, James, would you like to provide any further detail? Yeah, sure, I can do that. So um, in, the, in the first instance, uh, there's a, we have a concern about marketing. Um, well, I'd actually step back from that. The first, instance, the, the first issue we have is we have to find a way to get a better hold on who the players are. I'd say right now we have we have three buckets. We have the 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 reputable uh, consumer guarantee contract companies. Uh, and then we have, uh, as I was discussing once with the AARP, the dubious, they are registered here, uh, but they're not um, acting in accordance with our statutory requirements. And then the third bucket of the people who I guess some, some people say completely scam. Uh, and so the first thing we see is we see a lot of very over the line 
marketing uh, to elders um, that is confusing um, for elderly people, especially with our increased dementia we have in the country. Um, so and then also telemarketing to them. So that's that's one concern. And then even after, let's say that uh, that that elderly person purchases that contract, we have a concern whether they even get a contract or whether they just they just pay money and they never see anything uh, as a result of the money paid, which we've had that. And then they contact us and we have to run it down. And then once we started running these issues down, then we get into the labyrinth of the different um, uh, corporate structures that are put together and multiple companies. And we, it is a little bit confusing who's doing what uh, and where the policy, where the contracts are even coming from. Because you have sellers who are not licensed as producers, so they're not regulated in, in, in separately, who are selling. And then we have obligors who would be more like the insurance company. Uh, and the control over that whole process, uh, we need we need to get under control. Uh, and then on the back end, as the uh, commissioner said, we also have had uh, concerns about how the contracts are written and how the claims are processed. So we also have uh, concerns about forms. So we've, we've definitely set up um, four or five proposals from form review, advertising review, uh, potential ability to go to the Consumer Protection Act, um to kind of work through during the legislative process to make sure that we land at the right balance for protecting consumers which is hugely important but also allow the industry to operate but the legitimate industry to operate and make sure we have enough safeguards to stop the dubious companies and the complete scam companies andrew you're on mute uh, Katie asks, please provide more detail about the types of regulations you're proposing for HCSMs. Thank you. Sure, Katie. Well, I don't know if we have your email address, but we sent out a copy of the proposal that uh, we've put out for review and for comment uh, from industry. If you haven't received that, you can go ahead and leave your email right in the chat box and we can get you a copy of our proposal. Uh, but broadly speaking, it's a lot um, there are a lot of similar principles to what James described. We want to understand who the players are here in New Hampshire uh, so that we can ensure that the consumer is being protected. You know, it's important to appreciate that, you know, my first couple of months here at the department were largely uh, taken up with the whole Trinity Alera uh, incident in which uh, that company was here one day and then poof, went bankrupt and was gone the next and left a whole bunch of those consumers in the lurch. And it's important to understand that when that happens, unless it happens within an open enrollment period, uh, those consumers are really going to scramble to find coverage because the loss of a health share coverage is not considered a qualifying condition uh, to be able to access the individual market. So we wanna know who is doing business in New Hampshire. We wanna get a sense of how many consumers uh, they are providing services to, uh, things of that nature, so that God forbid something should go wrong, uh, we are able to step in and be an advocate for that consumer. Uh, so those are the broad principles. And again, we can get you the particular uh, proposal so that you can review it. Uh, we are going to put together a meeting uh, with interested parties so that we can talk through uh, what we're proposing and hear any issues that you might have. Uh, Paul Brand, uh, Brand asks, um, any concerns with the department that insurance companies might start refusing coverage for certain weather and or environmental events, as is happening in other states like California and Florida? Uh, not that I've seen. Obviously, James, you can chime in if you've seen any movement in that direction. Uh, the only uh, thing no. that I... Go ahead, James, sorry. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah we, always, we always say, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of things there. So one is we have not seen that. Uh, and um, we would have some uh, public interest concerns on, under, you know, form approval if there was a substantial uh, reduction in coverage based on something that's not happening in New Hampshire that's happening in California because we're not California. So that's what we kind of look at both those issues. But I would use this question as an opportunity to once again remind people to look into flood insurance. Uh, it is not part of your underlying homeowners insurance. Uh, that is the biggest environmental event or the most frequent environmental event that we do see in New Hampshire. Uh, so again, I'll use this as an opportunity to bang the drum of awareness around flood insurance. 
I see a question uh, from John asks, uh, what is the proposed time frame for amending RSA 412 uh, 35 to allow for virtual uh, workers comp audit inspections? Sure. So I'm going to answer that question by providing a little bit of background about how the legislature uh, works through their legislative session. So anybody who has watched Schoolhouse Rock gets a sense of how this all works. It's going to start in either the House or the Senate first. Uh, they will act upon it. They may amend it. They may uh, make some changes. But once they agree on what that final language looks like, they will pass it out. It will head over to the House. It will go through the House committee process, hopefully ultimately get to the House floor, and then make its way to the governor. Uh, assuming that the version of the bill that the House passes is the same as the Senate. Otherwise, it'll have to go to a committee of conference where they'll work out those differences so that they can get on the same page uh, with the same language of that bill. That process typically takes from January until May. Uh, so we're looking at a January until May legislative process. And then bills typically have one of three um, effective uh, provisions. It will either be effective immediately upon signature of the governor. It will either be 60 to uh, 30 to 60 days after the governor's signature, or it will take effect January 1st of the next year. Uh, we will take a look at what is most appropriate for those particular changes, but it will fall into one of those buckets. Uh, but you should get a good sense as to where this legislation is, what it looks like, uh, whether or not it's going to go forward. Uh, sometime, uh, you know, before June. I don't see any other questions. Uh, I do note that there's a few people who are looking to be added to the um, uh, stakeholder meeting. And uh, Brian, we will definitely send you the proposed regulations uh, that you're asking for. Uh, right now, I've sent in the chat there um, a few points of interest from our end. Uh, first of all, our phone number so that everyone here knows that they can always reach us. Uh, during business hours, uh, the communications email address. So if you have um, a question that uh, you'd like to direct to someone here specifically, I can certainly help you do that. Myself and AJ are um, here to help. Uh, and our consumer services email and phone number so that uh, if you know of a consumer that needs to reach us, they can do so. And then additionally, uh, links to our Twitter, our Facebook, and our YouTube channel. And uh, you know we've really done a good job over the last year of uh, bringing quality webinars each month and looking forward to the next two months, we've got uh, consumer focused price transparency, uh, talking a little bit more about the tra uh, price transparency issue. And then in October, we'll have a, a webinar discussing understanding your auto rates. Um, so if you guys want to um, uh, join us for those, you certainly are welcome to. We'll be sending out invites. And as always, uh, the webinars are hosted along with other additional informational videos on our YouTube channel. We invite you to check those out. Um, will you circulate your slide deck? Um, we can do that. I believe we'll be able to do that. Uh, Richard, why don't you ping me at communications at ins.nh.gov there and, and we'll send that to you. And uh, everyone else, we've got your email addresses. Uh, Monica will add you as well. So we appreciate you. If there's any other questions, uh, please type them in the chat box now. We'll address those. Otherwise, if you want to be added to any of these uh, lists or receive more information, just email our communications department, uh, communications at ins.nh.gov, and uh, we'll paste that in the chat again so you have it. Uh, don't ever hesitate to reach out. We can help you reach any of our subject matter experts here at the department. Uh, DJ, any final thoughts? No, I'd just like to thank everybody for joining us today. I'd like to thank my colleagues for what I think has been another very informative webinar, and we look forward to seeing everybody again next month. Thank you, guys. Take care.